Katz, I am so excited to sit down with you, pick your mind, peer behind the veil a little bit. Um, I was completely entranced when I saw your video, Kolga. I, the way you weaved together some of those melodies, it, I, I, I sent you a brief. You saw the reaction where. I like it gave me goosebumps. It completely wrapped me up and I was just like, oh my God, this was so entrancing. It was it was beautiful. And I could tell right away with you that this this singing is not just a it's not just surface. It's coming from a deep place. And you mm -hmm. could feel that emotion and that song. So being able to sit down with you is a real honor. I'm I'm so grateful that you took time to talk with me. Yeah, I'm I'm very happy to be here. And I was also really touched actually with um well, I was sent your reaction video by someone and uh yeah, I watched it and I was kind of moved with seeing the impact that song can have on other people in general. And yeah, of course it's you're always curious how people are gonna respond and especially if that's an emotional response, it means yeah, there is a connection, right? Like the emotion carries through the song, whether it doesn't matter what language you're singing in. So that's that's just beautiful. So I'm happy to be here so we can chat a bit and uh, talk about this album, Saula, of course, uh, that comes out next week. So it's, yeah, it's going to be. It's exciting. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, it's, it's really wild. I have found that music, even singing in other languages, has been very moving for me. I... I don't know. I'm, I'm kind of an empath. So I pick up on more on the emotion. Sometimes like I can completely disregard what they're saying and I yeah. feel. So that song was really, it was, it was really cool. So I'm very excited to dive into more and just hear more from you. Um, but before we get this thing rolling, how are you doing really truly? I'm doing good. Uh, this is of course a, a bit of an intense period uh, doing a uh, little bit of album interviews um, most of the days of the week now, but uh, it's also good to kind of reflect on on what I've made over the last years. Uh, and yeah, and now that it's coming out to the world, I think it's, it's nice to talk about all of the things that I've put in. And so I'm doing good. Um, yeah, it's, it's called a campaign, you know, <laughs> and uh, I've never as an artist had that before. It's also the first time that I release not independently, but on a label. So that's all new and it comes with a lot of new pros and cons. Uh, but I'm definitely super grateful that now I have like uh, assembled myself like this super female power girl promoters group they are so excellent in what they do and they have you know a lot more a handle on how this all goes and for me as an artist and producer I'm just riding the wave and it brings actually really beautiful conversations so it feels really enriching yeah this is uh yeah this is just another kind of what what's the term another piece in the ladder that you've been climbing throughout your career your life and where you're headed this is just you've already been somebody that's been able to touch on a lot of things i, I remember i listened to something you said where like for a long time you were traveling with um oh you were traveling with a group and you were just selling t-shirts and yes. all these all these little things add to your character and and also, too, I think that makes you very inviting personally to communicate with and to talk with because you feel very you feel very open to talk about these things, which is really nice. Yeah, I I, I hope to be at least that's uh, something I also discovered is a passion of mine is to talk with especially with other artists and creatives like the, about the things they are encountering and how to sort of help uh with our knowledge together like group together because a lot of us uh especially if you work in music we start out 
all of us independently, right? And you don't really know how to start releasing music yet or printing uh, materials or like, mm -hmm. there's so much to learn just besides making your songs and being in that creative process of, you know, voicing your own unique sound and, and voice. So I, I really love to to be open uh, and talk with other people in the industry and also especially with my colleague artists, especially female artists. And I think also that my history of doing a little bit of everything from selling t-shirts for other groups, from, you know, being being a crew member with, with other touring bands for so many years, um, having seen the highs and lows of bands who, who got signed and then uh, maybe things didn't work out the way they, they had envisioned or people who deliberately chose to say independent, all of that you sort of start to take it in into your own mm -hmm. creative process as well. And for me, what I'm discovering a lot lately is that it's very important to pay it forward and to share our knowledge and to sort of be um, wisdom keepers of that, but to share it. And that is that is maybe the openness that you were referring to. Like in another podcast, they said, you're the nicest person there is. And I, I said, yeah, but for me, what I'm doing, it's it's just second nature to me because I treat this as a community uh, and, and I see other people as part of the community and and so it's just nice to connect and yeah be open and, and that can be any conversation it can, I, can also a conversation on the merchandise stall right that yeah. can be magical uh, actually so you never you never know where there could be something amazing hidden and exactly. I think a lot of people can get stuck in a mindset that they're only looking for that big, bright moment, and they they miss out on so many other little things. I heard this this anal this story that somebody told me, and it stuck with me my whole life. They said so many people they want to be a shooting star because they're big, they're bright, they they light up the sky when they go by. But the problem with that is they're here and then they're gone. <laughs> Yeah. You you have to strive to be like the North Star, always there, always present, always pressing forward. And like I remember that analogy and I've thought about that. And and that has had a big effect on me as well because I have my purpose. I have my focus on what I'm doing. And it's not the typical what most people that are doing what I'm doing, it's not the typical reason, you know? And yeah. so Mm. Yeah, I I think a lot of people are focus driven. Like I I do, you know, also have that, and I think a lot of artists have that. That always something that you're encountering can be a conversation, can be an inspiration. In nature mm -hmm. can be a sentence in a book you're reading, and you sort of collect it, you know, like into the database of your mind. Like, oh, that can be really useful for my album or my project or or stuff like that. And I think. You know, that kind of collecting of inspirational gems can can only happen when we are open and making contact with others. Uh, but I also feel that sometimes it is about literally just being in exactly in conversation. And uh, and yeah, and it's so important to realize that every <laughs> with your analogy, like every little star matters for like to create a whole firmament. It's. The, the, the crew, the technical crew, for example, on the tours, just as important, maybe even more so, because they're the one loading loading in and out first, you know, and, mm -hmm. and, and last. So it's, it's just important to try to see the whole picture. And I also believe as an artist to still navigate, to try to find your own voice in that. You know, we might feel we are small sometimes, you know, but we, we can make a difference with our voice or with exactly like you say one little thing could alter someone's life maybe potentially so yeah that's interesting mm. Mm. kind of like a a little knot on the road of of weird of fate like when that happens yeah yeah that little what is it the little pebble that gets thrown in the water and it's the little ripples yeah. but the ripples keep going exactly yeah 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 that's awesome all right, so one thing I learned about you is you play a lot of traditional old 
like the old Nordic instruments. How like can you name like some of them and and you got to tell me though what is like your favorite one to play? Like give me your top 3 favorite instruments to play. Um so I started uh on the musical thoughts actually after hearing a drum. Uh it was like a shaman drum. Um uh, mm-hmm. so the sound of the drum is very important to me. Uh not only from a musical aspect but also what it does, you know, for the human mind and human consciousness it, it, it's something so primal the sound of drumming it it connects mm-hmm. with our inner rhythms you know but when you talk about these really old instruments my first instrument was the Mikkel Harpa uh, you can see it in the background actually hanging mm-hmm. on the wall it's a Swedish keyed fiddle um, it's played with a bow and it has keys and mm-hmm. a lot of extra strings that are just vibrating along. And those resonance strings, they create that kind of melancholic and really large soundscaping. It's, it's almost instantaneously cinematic when you play it. It's, it has a huge volume when, when you play it, uh, even unamplified. Um, and for me, that was also the first of this type of instruments that come from, uh, you know, the old old times, historical instruments that I, I started to learn. Mm-hmm. Um, and then, of course, there are variants of that. So there are earlier historical findings of nickel harpa. And one of those predecessors is the Mora harpa, hangs next to it. It's the same kind of model, but it doesn't have the resonance strings yet because we are going further in the past. And if you go even more uh, into the past, you come to those toggle harpas um, or yohikos or like these really, really old rural instruments. And they are not really a lot more than a box of wood with horsehair strung up to it and another horsehair bow. And just the rubbing of those horsehairs on this wooden soundboard that, that is a wooden box uh, really has that archaic sound. It's like a time travel and uh, also really beautiful. I actually don't have a Tiger Harper yet, though someone has made one for me. I still have yet to receive it. So I'm really looking forward to expand my string collection there. And then I also experimented with a lot of uh, small percussive uh, instruments. Mm-hmm. Flutes, like bone flutes. I have a couple here. Mm-hmm. Uh, that's kind of nice because they're also made after. You want to give us a brief? You want to give us a brief little showing? <laughs> well, I, this one actually needs a lot of uh, warming up. This okay, is, gotcha. uh, ma- made from uh, swan bone. And it's actually a replica of a swan bone flute that they found in a cave. And this is actually on the new album recorded. Um, and what I also love is hammered dulcimer it's uh i love this i love hammering. dulcimers yeah it's most known in sound for people out there who think how does it sound like uh for the intro of game of thrones uh the mm-hmm. main t- where you have those big cellos da, 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 mm-hmm. and all the high sounding crispy hard rhythmical sounds that's hammered dulcimer uh, I love playing with that, of course, too. Yeah, there's a lot. Um, there's li- lyres and overtone flutes. Yeah, it's it's a lot, um, including, of course, the very necessary cowbell. Yes. It's on every <laughs> album. No. <laughs> love it. Love it. It's actually I... not on the album. <laughs> oh, you should. Just one little. It was a joke, but yeah. still. <laughs> I, I thought cool. you were serious. No. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Yeah, no, but I lo- yeah, I, I, I just love old and historic instruments and ethnic instruments, and and the thing is for me, there's, there's no limit to it, uh, except for like the wallets that I have available, because if it were up to me, I would, I would have lots more, and I do have to add to this that I, on none of these instruments, I am virtuoso. Like I really admire people who play, who like pick one and really specialize and learn how to play lots of traditional, very fast played uh, traditional tunes that are not like self-written, but they are mm-hmm. just coming, stemming from hundreds of years back. And those tunes are carried forth each generation. And I really admire and appreciate that. I listen to that privately for, for enjoyment and relaxation, but 
that's actually not how I use these instruments. I, I use them really in a, in a little bit more mod modest way of playing, but really to support an emotion. And so that can be very slow and dramatic and repetitive, or it can be really like powerful, like with ribs, making a lot of chords on it. But um, I do have to say, I do not play them very traditionally. I really play them the way they help the song best that I'm making. Mm. And my songs are more aimed on storytelling of emotions and ideas and, and some philosophy in there and wisdom than they that they are aimed on on being the, the best fiddler of the north or something not at all of of the matter so yeah that's that's my relation to these instruments and how how i play with them mm. when did when did you feel that pull to music and specifically to like i know you're from like you live in the netherlands so i can kind of draw that but like what pulled you to music, especially like the Nordic folk? When mm. did you feel that resonate inside you? Well, in the background, I was uh, already in touch and being a crew member of a group that was focused on uh, old Celtic and Gaelic songs, traditions, and uh, it was called Omnia. Uh, they also were the first group that actually started to use the word pagan folk. Um, and then also I did some touring with Faun, uh, a German band that also has a lot of these historic instruments and different They're incredible. Kind of, yeah, different influences. So their songs venture out into all these different cultures. There's nothing they won't do, whether it's from Turkey or, mm -hmm. uh, you know, Italy or going into old high German. They, they do it all, even also Nordic. But me, I, I don't know where it stems from. I, I was really one of the... The earlier ones, you could say, who was just captivated by, in particular, Scandinavian fairy tales, like even children's books that I like to read as an adult and looking at these like really beautiful paintings, like made by John Bauer of Sweden mm -hmm. or like. Landscape. He's incredible. Yeah, there was just something that really clicked with me on a, on a very kind of like soul level. And and so I try to you know being surrounded by these bands that have kind of other cultures as their main inspiration i thought why don't i try to make my own band uh try to do something with music and and then my idea was my handle was why don't i do scandinavian music i already had listened to garmarna and Hetnigarna, and i thought this is so cool i that's let's go there and then having had nickel harp i thought this is the perfect start we're going into Scandinavia and, and, and learning their songs and that's kind of songwriting. And so I cannot tell you exactly why, but I do mm -hmm. know it was really part of my interest and that I thought this is where I want to dive deeper. And that's how I also got to know then like other people who already worked with this material for like long, longer, who came from these countries, like the people uh, who are now in a group called Heilung, they at the time had a had a group called Valdera and were also making like beautiful fusion between electronic and traditional Scandinavian uh, tunes. And I also like got to see one of the very first concerts of Vartruna then in Norway. And so that's why I thought, okay, yeah, this is all this is the stuff. This is it. Yeah. So from, from there I just yeah started to learn more. And uh Actually, looking back, and this is also so so nice because now I can appreciate the effort, but also have seen how long I've how far I've come. Uh, my first song that I sang as a Dutch person uh, from Holland in Scandinavian language, it was really nothing sounding. It was really not proper Swedish, but mm -hmm. now I took you know like so many years later, fifteen years later, I took so much effort into learning also more about these old languages and Scandinavian languages and really trying to get it right. And yeah, having help with professors in linguistics and stuff to even even craft my own words in, in uh, what is not my native tongue or what is even a dead language. So it's, yeah, it's been also nerdy 
but uh, I guess it was an obsession of me, this whole Scandinavia, and I just dove in for last era. <laughs> So, you, I yeah. could tell right. I could tell right away with you that you're a storyteller. I could mm -hmm. tell that you were. Um, you're. I could tell that the music is just a part of it. It's just a facet, you know. But you have you have stories to be told. I could tell that, and mm -hmm. I I'm the same way. I love I love stories. I love and I too. <laughs> it it feels kind of nerdy, but like I'm 37 years old and I still love like old tales. I love, <laughs> I I. I'm fascinated by them still. They're comfort to me. They're, they're, so I understand. I understand completely. Yeah. I and I relate completely. Um, yeah. What I love that you actually kind of focus your music around the folklore, um, mm -hmm. and I know, and I know you probably use them to have moments to throw in, you know, wisdom and life, your own personal life, kind of intertwined. What is some of your favorite um, mythos to you personally? Uh, like, is there a story that you really like, or it's not a uh, one story in particular? Um, if I go to the a little bit the other end of the spectrum than what the album went into, like on a personal level, I still really enjoy a ch ch children's tale like Ronya the Robber's Daughter. <laughs> but so that's a little bit more the romanticized, you know, Scandi. Mm -hmm kind of uh, basis but uh but like the album really went deep into the mythology and a little bit like the historical background as well that we see around more the feminine role in nordic mm -hmm. myth uh and uh, especially also the the roles women had um whether they were persecuted or have sacrificed something or whether they were actually in a position of power and wisdom as uh, seers or prophesizers and uh, people who were uh, at one part part of history uh, maybe welcomed to help predict the weather or solve a, a murder case by talking to communion with spirits or uh, you know or later part of history were where it was feared and actually it was forbidden you know to do uh, certain nordic magic you know and it was really also very much tied to to the feminine role in society um uh, and yeah for me it was just i really felt it's also important to shed light on that aspect uh especially what we see now we see so many uh really beautiful uh, but very powerfully masculine sort of renditions and and shapes in uh, and modern entertainment, even in TV, uh, of this Viking Age era, you know, and uh, I thought, well, there's actually more, more to to shed light on, and yeah, having had this uh, patron of sorts, this Ram goddess, mm. there we come already a little bit into those more hidden realms. Like there's less source material available. Uh, who were these nine daughters of her that I named my songs after? Uh, what did they represent? Um, you know, it was so much to unpack. And at the same time, finding out like, oh, there's actually not that much preserved specifically in old Spaldic text or references in, you know, the uh, codex regions or anything, you know. So I had to go through all the sagas and reinterpret or sort of weave my own way through and so what I did uh, as an artist I tied it in you know especially if there's room creative freedom mm -hmm. uh, I tied these nine daughters of the sea the, uh, those like uh, carriers of the sun into weather conditions that we can encounter at, at sea especially mm. if you are seafaring folk it can be really important you know to navigate calm seas or like wild seas and i also tied it in with the feminine emotional world like the inner world which can also we as humans we have all the ranges of emotion so yeah that that's how i did it on this album like the story is really a journey of sorts and and we're going through different emotions on this album <laughs> uh with these different uh names of the daughters of the sea from like Blodukadda to Dröfen to Unner to 
Hemingway, which is a total heartbreak ballad, you know? So it's like, we're really going through it. And uh, yeah, that's, uh, yeah. Also, as you said before, a little bit more into the storytelling mm -hmm. uh, and uh, having the Nordic cosmos as, as the, the framework for that. Yeah. That's awesome. When you told me that the songs are named after the nine daughters, I was like, oh, that's so cool. So that's really awesome. So is Kol is Kolga one of them? One of the daughters? Yeah, exactly. What's... Yeah. Dive a little bit deeper into that song. Sure. Yeah. Well, Kolga, like the, the name itself at, uh, from etymology, you're going to get stranded. Uh, but for me, I do see a very direct line to uh, like fr frost, like ice cold um, mm -hmm. and like cold, cold. Um, and for me, I really tied it in with uh, a melodic hook we already had laid down, which was so dramatic, so dark and so... Um, was that the part of the chorus? Solid. Yeah. The so solid. I Isla, Isla. Yeah. yeah. 60 names and so if we look at this really cold weather co condition and where the where the ocean is where the temperature drops that low uh humans if you would fall into that kind of icy realm of water you would within three minutes you would be gone because the water actually takes your breath away it strangles you it it's mm -hmm. uh your lungs cannot cope with that kind of uh climate so uh it's it's really like an ice hand of death you know mm -hmm. and the real mortis that sinks in so for me kolga is is also about ice cold truths like things that can just kill you inside you know um and so death is is the carrier and we see these 16 names in the uh, chorus um and of course uh the names of these ladies they're all part of the nordic mythologies but uh this yeah the observer will see that these stories are not uh, always crossing or relating to each other they are actually from different time periods but there is a red thread going through all these uh feminine names like they all have made one sacrifice or the other to change the outcome of faith and um i'm honoring with this song also the sacrifices that women in general make in their lives that is not really talked about and so it's been it's been a deep song it's it's a, it's a little bit of a turning point also on on the album when that song starts it, it you're really entering into a darker territory right after as well sort of in the afterlife or the mm -hmm. in between so yeah polga 16 has had such an amazing response also because I think when I was singing it in the studio room, I was really embodying those emotions of almost feeling like chilled to to death myself, like really having that really like cold grip on my heart. And so what you can what you can hear is that the voice actually does break on a few moments in the song. Um, but we kept it in there because we thought it's it doesn't make sense to do another take that's maybe perfect perfectly sung without having a little bit that break on the on the voice mm -hmm. because we are actually we are embodying this like we want also the record to reflect a real emotion and i think that's especially when you do something real and it's not just a performance um people can feel that when when something on the record has a lot of emotion true emotion behind it and so yeah i think that it unfortunately is something we can all relate to right having lost someone that you grieve over having made a huge sacrifice having a ice cold truth you know um so yeah that's cool that when i did my reaction i was just like oh man this is different like this feels different and um and you could feel and again, because it, I wasn't really looking down at like the subtitles that you had popped up in English. So I'm I'm listening just to you, and I'm listening to what whatever I'm feeling, whatever's popping into my soul or whatever. And yeah, there's definitely a um, 
I, I think at one point I was even like, I was like, <laughs> I got chills. I got chills, you know? So, um, that yeah. was a, that was awesome. Thanks for like diving into that because I think when people watch this, they're going to go, this is all just really good for people to understand the, the deeper side of this. Mm -hmm. Like, it's more than just, well, I wrote a few songs, I went into the studio and played some really yeah. cool melodies, and then here you go, enjoy my album. Yeah, unfortunately, it's it's not it's not been that that's such a merry ride at all. I had to go through quite a lot of trauma in, in my life as well. And I use art as one of the ways to sort of make a catharsis, to alchemize it into something else, to make something beautiful out of having had a loss, having had, you know, uh, lost people or uh, someone you miss or illness that you are having to deal with or heartbreak or whatever it is for you that you personally have had to sacrifice something or someone for. Um, it's, it's just, yeah. It's just, it it stems from a real place. And then having, of course, the reach, research tied, tied to it to, to have this beautiful framework of these Nordic myth stories and, and to say, let's look at these women as well, what they did and, uh, and honor that of sorts. I think there's something too deep within us when it comes to these stories. I think there is like a deep longing in some of us that some people might not want to admit that there's a part of you that might, you might just maybe believe they're real or, or that if, if somehow like your mind tells you they're not real, but something in your soul says, but I want them real. I want them. And, and so they become personal. They become, you know, because you feel so strongly to these women of old yeah. Yeah. and and on top of that there is a connection to your own soul to these stories so you're not just like telling stories of some women of folklore the, yeah. they are like there there's a, almost like an essence of like they're kind of real to you yeah you know? well, I, it, in in a sense they are you know what whatever was the origin of these stories um whether that is yes or no a historical uh person or uh just like especially if you look at oral society it goes you know from generation to generation so things get a bit morphed things get a bit warped or you it's the creation of archetypes of sorts mm -hmm. uh but i i see it as a long line of our forefathers and foremothers of of our ancestors and so i would say it's a little bit tying into ancestral wisdom or like what the collective wisdom has been passed on because there's a reason the story survives up until today it's not only yeah of course there's luck that you know some vellum was preserved and that you know mm -hmm. we actually still have access to to some uh, historical documents but but on the other hand, otherwise they would have also survived orally. And, and we still see that in, in cultures worldwide, that there's still like a really large tradition. And, and especially if you start to look at other myths worldwide, I think personally, we really see a connection. Like there are like archetypes in one culture and in the other, and they're very similar. So for me, there's a reality to that. There's, there's a collective wisdom behind that. There's an ancestral wisdom behind those archetypes. And if you believe in, in, in energy or, or source or, or, you know, whatever you call it, so, some people call it uh, angels from one religion or mm -hmm. they call it the gods in the other. Or I do believe that, that they can be compounded into some characters too who's played a pivotal role in society or 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 in story i think it, yeah if, if if we really are technical about it we all we all listen to stories of history like that is what history is history yeah. is 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 stories exactly. and there's some evidence you know throughout and i'm sure you know these stories can't just you know, 
I guess they could come out of thin air, but a lot of times they're they're derived from somebody from the human experience, you know, and um yeah. Yeah, yeah. that's why I think there is like there's truth to a lot of these because you because can't just... it's varied, yeah, by generations. And yeah. So, yeah. Uh, for me, it's very, uh, like I don't like to, to give it like a very specific name, but, but I do, uh, I do feel sometimes, at least when I am recording and in in the state of mind that I bring myself into before I do that, and and when I'm writing, and these words, you know, these poems come true. Or, I do feel that that line to to the ancestral world, to the foremothers, and and to yeah, to try to just be like an extension of energy. But this is also now like then we go into life philosophy. Why are we here as human beings, and who are we? For me, we really are also a living experience, all of us individually, of something greater than ourselves, and so. Yeah, right now, my ancestral mothers, they're living through me, right? And my daughter will be the next in line and the next. So, yeah, in that way, I hope we can also carry forth some, some strength and maybe also stories of endurance and overcoming difficulties in life. And that, for me, is what essentially Saula, the album, is about. It's like finding the strength in yourself and the resource to overcome difficulties and to to feel whole no matter what uh what life kind of throws at you and so that's why we have all those different emotions uh portrayed also because it's, it's part of life and that is also being angry and upset and that is also being really heartbroken or can also unfortunately be uh enduring a type of illness as a, almost like a form of initiation into the depths and the wisdom that lie behind being ill. It's terrible for anyone. Like I know it from personal experience, but to yeah, hopefully overcome it or otherwise find peace with it. It's There's wisdom to be found also in all texts about subjects as these. So yeah. <laughs> heavy stuff but yeah yeah how do you how do you personally keep your mental health in check with these deep subjects because they they do pull on the soul yeah well for me that is like i guess also one of the reasons why i'm creating art or art well songs it's like for me this is like a way to almost like therapy it's it's therapy, but it's I also see it as an alchemical process. Like I'm really trying to find the kernel of what was I supposed to learn from this mm. and try to implement that in a song. And and it's kind of a funny philosophy, but for me, when I when a song is finished, I feel I've learned the lesson or like I've got a bridge, a grasp on it and can move further into the next round and the next. And that's literally also one of the reasons why this album has taken a long time not only for research that's necessary but also to really say i've got a handle on this now now it's song worthy so if if i wrote a song about something it's because i've i've got a handle on it and i've got the kernel of it of, for myself and if i've written a song for someone yeah. else it's the best compliment there is, of course, but it also means like I've worked my way through something. So it's done. <laughs> so. See, and that's that right there is a little like nugget for people to understand the power of of this process for you and the mm -hmm. the the album, because to other people, you know, you could just write songs really quick and put them out there. But for you personally, like these songs, every song is a is a challenge of sorts yeah. it's a it's a journey you know yeah that's really yeah. it's really brilliant they're what like is a... of mine <laughs> yeah <laughs> you should they literally are yeah, yeah like in a sense you know they are and, and and that's i just realized actually while we're talking like that's actually funny with having it on as the artist name which is linked to uh one of my ancestors actually that's why i took on this name and 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 having had these these songs you know as children of such but yeah i would also of course like to, to add on to this that these songs they're not only like uh it's not like oh you're gonna read cutty's 
diary, you know, like I really try to lift this up into something that is broadly carried, that can be relevant for anybody listening, that can, you know, be an uplifter or a form of support, or even especially when people are down or like really have to come out of a dark black hole themselves there's a way and i really hope that that's just can carry across and without it being like particularly tied to my personal life you know i really try to make it broader than that and and the nordic mythology has been an, an amazing way for me to do that just to take inspiration from from there and really dig in and also the different uses of language on the album has been really a personal revelation as well. Um, and so there's also a few songs in English on the album, besides mm -hmm. all the old Nordic languages. And I'm touching on that because it's even more directly connecting to the listener. Like here we can really understand what's being sung, no matter, almost no matter where you come from, because well, most people in the world can understand English nowadays. So yeah, it's even more up close and personal that way. And it's it's a song that also has to do with mental health. So mm -hmm. I can't wait. I'm I'm getting like I'm listening to you describe it and I'm just like, oh, I cannot wait to hear this. Um, <laughs> yeah. What what is you don't have to tell us what the song is about. Mm -hmm. I know that these are all your you love all these songs, but what yeah. is one song that you're really excited for people to hear? Could you tell us the name? Um well, there are a few, actually. What's uh, the big one? What's the one you're like, ooh, I cannot wait? Yeah, it actually has been released already. So, uh, like, for me, the most heavy song or, like, the most proud song, uh, I don't know if you can call it like that, but, yeah, it was actually the first single, Stone Pillars, uh, but we did it as a soft release, so it hasn't had, like, a super amount of attention yet, but for me, that was... Uh, really one of the songs I really wanted to have on the album promotion campaign precisely for this reason mm -hmm. and yeah I'm also going to be curious what people's responses are going to be uh, to Segetner for example this is a, 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 a an intense one it's like more the uh, call it by its name kind of song with like a feminine uh, choir that calls people out and uh, doing work crimes and uh, that's of all ages and so here it's linked to the burning of Uppsala temples and the priestesses there um, and uh, but yeah it is it is also in a sense an anti-war song and so uh, the chorus is set to um, say it now say it now tell them tell them tell them all manhun uh, darya like man dogs that you are which of course you know, I, I hope not every man will take this very badly to heart, but it is it is really about the violence that is coming into um, conquering of new lands and all of that, you know, like heavy topics that, that are like topics of all, all times. And so it is a feminine voice against the destruction uh, of nature as well. And that's what is sacred, you know, like... Uh, what we what we want to protect with each other and what we want to nurture and so, yeah, I I think there's gonna be that's gonna be an interesting, uh, song for people to listen to because it's pretty angry. Like my vocal performance there is like really like spitting wrath, like a like a fleet thing, like a Norse rap battle. Yeah. And I think people more have heard me calm and a little bit more pretty and. Uh, here there's no filter on that I'm, I'm kind of angry on that song it's rage. <laughs> so, yeah. yeah yeah what speaking of like Norse and pagan and you have seen you've seen like a rise in a lot of people embracing the do I say religion or do I say mm. the beliefs there's a lot of people that have like risen up and embraced like the Nordic way, the Nordic culture, like all over the world, especially over here in the States. It's a lot. Like there's a lot of people that have the, what is uh, like, what's your thoughts on that? Like with the, do I say resurgence? I don't think so. Yeah. You've you seen mean, a rise. You've seen a rise. You're talking about the, the pagan 
communities uh, yeah right? mm -hmm. yeah well well of course it's been very interesting to see that happening over the last uh, 10 years it 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 was actually also in another interview so it is something that's being picked up on like this has significantly risen interest mm -hmm. in this and yeah also some sort of a connection to personal religion for people or mm -hmm. the way they see the world um i myself i don't call myself a pagan uh or not anymore <laughs> uh, mm -hmm. beginning i might have done because i thought oh that's that was a little bit before this had grown big and i thought okay that really kind of captures the idea of having um if we call it pagan folk then it's clear that it's uh aimed towards pre-christianity era mm -hmm. and that it covers folklore from a time before the con conversion to christianity of those countries and so it was a little bit more illustratively aimed towards what era are we sitting in with our fairy tale traditional folk tunes um and so uh, less so about being any kind of uh, uh religious format and for me i don't i don't yeah as i said i don't uh feel comfortable actually calling myself a pagan because uh as soon as things have a name like that a lot of people are probably discussing with each other what that actually means and who is wrong who is right and for me that is losing the way like uh originally yeah. if we look at history uh um, the christians called people who were of pagan belief heathens because they did not subscribe to that christianity um religious impact on their country and they held on to their native folk customs and beliefs and so that was actually broader than being aimed towards one certain god or deity that you worshipped it was a lot bigger than that it was uh, stemming actually from animism like nature religion and being uh, one with nature and seeing everything around you even inanimate objects like stones or even a river as a living being and so the rivers got names and you know even the stones were not considered dead items and so there was wisdom in that uh, but now we see with paganism coming back to your question and the rise of uh, religious identity around that uh, I'm afraid to see it go in the direction of dogma, the same as any other religion is uh, shaped. And the dogma is then, so this is my religion, this is the only truth, and nothing but the truth here. Like, this is my God, and every other God is wrong. And that, to me, is just, that's, that's, that doesn't work like that. So if, yeah. if paganism is going in that direction then I'm a little bit fearful for it. And I would hope that people at least be encouraged or invited to say, where is this name coming from? And why did I, why do I call myself that? Uh, because otherwise, if you're really very strongly attached to, for example, a Nordic God pantheon, then it's more, then it's more also true, uh, like the Nordic God's religion. And uh, yeah, of course, if people find uh, strength in there and, and, you know, the need, I think it stems all from the need for having communion and having a rhythm to life, and having seasonal rhythm to life. And, and in that sense, not being lost, you know, without structure for a lot of people who are not going to churches or anymore or any other uh we practiced established religion there's still a lot of need for communion and for some kind of traditional way of life you know to go through the year and so people should of course do what what they feel best with and good with and definitely love your gods or goddesses or whatever but uh, I myself, uh, also as an artist who works with northern gods uh, in the material and, and who have been some sort of a, a patron for me because I worked with all this material for some years now, um, I still don't consider myself a pagan. 
I'm not practicing in any with any rules. Um, but I do see uh, myself more thinking in the same line as this older nature religions where everything is alive. And what I love is that that is also seen back in science. And we see it also in other older religions like Shintoism from Japan, for example. It's mm -hmm. really broader than just the North. It's, it's a worldwide idea. Mm -hmm. And that's, and that, uh, for me, gives a good uh, basis, I guess, of interacting with the world as a human being and with other species and nature. And to I, do that respectfully. Yeah. Well, yeah. I, I long answer, but yeah. No, no. I Yeah. I think you touched on something really important. Mm. These are these religion in general, or like a, a a person's belief, should be a very personal thing. And when yes. you like what you said, the dogma of pushing or being like this is the only way, it's like follow your heart, follow your intuition, follow what you want to believe. Do that personally. Do that with yeah. you. And if you if you meet somebody that it kind of aligns great you can build a, a a friendship or whatever but i i agree with you i think people are just hungry for something and especially you know unfortunately we can be kind of fed by other other people strong groups this is the only way you have to yeah. believe this and yeah. people you know and people are hungry. People are hungry for something, especially if they believe that for a long time. So no, I I see everything you meant. It, it just it should just be personal. You should practice on your, like your own. Do your thing. And if you meet other people that line up, hey, awesome. Yeah, but, exactly. But but still keep in check. Yeah, for me that is like I'm I'm really okay saying that as a person, also mm -hmm. as separate from my music, like. For me, it's just so important to give room there for each other. But we see, unfortunately, when things become, I wanted to say religiousized, but that's not a word. But when it, mm -hmm. when it, people form a religion out of it, then, then it comes with its rule books. And yes, thou shalt. it's dangerous. It's uh, dangerous. That's dangerous. That's, that's where we lose communion, actually, with each other. That's what we were so hungry for. That's where we lose understanding of listening and observing a uh, nature and taking yeah. things as they come <laughs> so. i i really appreciate your opinion on that that's really cool you know it's it's good i was wondering if you noticed that i've noticed it over here in the states um mm -hmm. the new album's coming out yeah it's gonna be exciting <laughs> what like what is the one thing that you really hope touches people when they hear this album like what's like what's one thing you really hope translates to them? Oh well, it's there's so much in in this one that that is very difficult to come pinpoint mm -hmm. to one thing. Uh, but what I would hope, uh, it is a little generic answer, but I would hope that people find some strength in it, like pers like some support if they if they are in a dark place. Yeah. Because that I think that's been unfortunately, but also beautifully, as life is, a little bit of the foundation of Saula of really trying to overcome anything and, and and even find beauty in that and and wisdom. And so that's, yeah, that's what I hope people take away from it. It's not in in one song yeah. per se. It's the whole soul of the album is shaped in that uh, I yeah, love that. That's that. That's <laughs> yeah. a good one. Yeah. That